I think Chuck would be upset we're st starting at one minute after. <laughs> he was always the first to be here. It's wonderful to see how the life of, of a couple and of Charles affect a lot of people. A lot of you have been directly affected by his life. In a prayer last night, a great-grandson of his prayed for his great-grandpa who was having fun in heaven. And uh, he says that because faith has spread itself through a family and through a church family, various church families. You'll notice in your program our schedule, and I'll be... Uh, initiating with the reading of an obituary of his life. And your friend, Billy Carroll, will then lead an opening prayer. I'll have a few reflections, and you can see how's, how the program continues down in front of you there. It's hard to sum up a life in six paragraphs, but we'll read this obituary that attempts to get us a glimpse and remind us of the wonderful man, the man of God, that he was. Now, Charles would not like this at all. <laughs> uh, he was always saying to us, don't look for glory. Don't look for glory. All the glory goes to God. So as we read this, let's think in terms of it being glory to God for how God worked through the life of a dear brother, a dear friend, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, an uncle, someone who just really, really affected the lives of so many of us here. To God be the glory we start. Charles Gamble was born on February the 19th, 1929. North Terre Haute, Indiana, to Everett and Verna Gamble. On November the 18th, 2017, at the age of 88, he peacefully departed this world from the NHC, National Health Care Nursing Home in Franklin, Tennessee, being sung to by, his, um, by Karen Gamble, Stephen's wife. Near my God to thee. Preceding him at death were his three beloved brothers, Art, Jean, and Don. He is survived by his wife of nearly 67 years. It would have been December the 26th that he would have had uh, that anniversary. Betty Gamble of Franklin, Tennessee, his wife of nearly 67 years, Betty Gamble of Franklin. Charles also leaves behind his two children, Diane, her husband Steve, Till of Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and Stephen, his wife Karen Gamble of Franklin, Tennessee. The Gambles were blessed with four grandchildren and nine great-grandchildren. After graduating from Otter Creek High School, he was probably the smallest one in the high school, Charles continued his studies at Rose Polytechnic Institute in Terre Haute, Indiana. He earned a BS in mechanical engineering in November of 1949. Charles briefly worked as an engineer. That so pervaded the way he, uh, he thought. He was an engineer. Due to the conf Korean conflict, he enlisted in the Air Force in November of 1950. He married Betty Imogene Greer on December the 26th, 1950. After training in Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, he was sent to Japan on September, in September 1952. He was there for 18 months, during which time he and Betty's first child, Diana was born. Upon his return to the States, Charles studied at Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama. 
to earn a BS in electrical engineering in, in December of 1955. Then began his work as a research engineer with General Motors in Detroit, Michigan, with Frigidaire in Dayton, Ohio, from 1956 to 1966. Later, with Delco Electronics in Kokomo, Indiana, 1966 to 1976. Perhaps more significant to him, Charles graduating from Sunset School of Preaching in Lubbock, Texas, in 1978. This began a new horizon as he shifted to full-time ministry. During his preaching ministry, he helped to establish this church, this wonderful church, the Summit Church of Christ in Cold Spring, Kentucky, beginning in April 1979, working with that congregation for seven and a half years and many other brothers who came alongside him to work in establishing this church he then moved to Wapakoneta, Ohio, where he helped to establish the Church of Christ of all Glaze County, and various ones are here from that church, in November 1986, working there until he retired in 1994. At that point, he returned to Summit to work in personal evangelism until he and Betty moved to Franklin in August of 2014. Brother Billy, would you come forward? Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank Thee for this avenue of prayer that we have, that we can come to Thee, petition of our needs, and come to Thee in thanksgiving. Dear Lord, we thank You for the beautiful day that You've given us as we look outside and just see the beautiful blue skies. It just helps us to realize that we serve a great God. And dear Lord, we know the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Dear Lord, we thank Thee for everyone who was represented here today. We thank Thee that You gave everybody safe travels and pray You continue to be with them. Dear Lord, we thank Thee as all of our friends and families are gathered here to celebrate the life of Chuck Campbell. Dear Lord, we pray that the, the tears that will be shed will not be tears of sadness, but will be tears of gladness as we all uh, know about Chuck and his life, that he was always the life of the party. And dear Lord, we thank Thee that it is fitting that he, his memorial the celebration of his life is here at Summit, where him and several other families, like the Watsons, the Carters and the Harlows and the Gambles uh, seen a vision to set a church upon this hillside, and we thank you for that. Dear Lord, we thank you for his service here, that he was the first minister here, and that he was the first, uh, one of the first elders here also. And dear Lord, we thank you for the life that, that he led, that he led the same life as his Lord and Savior, that he had a love for lost souls. Dear Lord, we know that as Steve has said, everybody in this building here that has been affected by his life, that he has either taught us or baptized many of us or went on to teach us bigger things and better things, how to become a better Christian husband, how to become better Christian deacons and elders. And we thank thee for the example that he led as he led us from the pulpit and as he was the overseer of the flock here at the Summer Church of Christ. Dear Lord, uh, we, we pray for the blessing of the Gamble family as they hit the holidays and realize that the patriarch of their family is no longer with them here physically, but is here with them spiritually. Dear Lord, we thank thee for his faithful wife, Betty. Dear Lord, we, uh, she knows, we know that her life just exemplifies uh, someone who is a minister's wife, who is an elder's wife, that is always uh, willing to give up her time and we thank thee for her service here as a teacher. And I know, I know that she's taught all three of my boys, and she's most probably taught every young person at Summit, and we thank you for that. We thank you for his two children, Steve and Diana, who are continuing in their parents' footsteps to be uh, messengers for you, and we thank you for their service there. Lord, we know that it is a blessing, and they are happy for those who die in the Lord. And dear Lord, we know our servant Chuck died in the Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you that you sent uh, Chuck and Betty here to, to Summit, to Cold Springs, Kentucky, to make uh, have a great influence as we see many of his neighbors here, that uh, Chuck lived to be a Christian 24 hours a day, and that he, his life always showed that. And he had a lot of 
um, examples of his humble service life, and we thank you for that. Dear Lord, we know that he had a good job, a secular job, and he could have made a lot of money, dear Lord, but we know that he chose a life to honor you and to go on to be a minister. And we see how he's, he's touched so many of our lives, and he has been a great example to each and every one of us as he had always teaching us to be better people. Dear Lord, we know that, uh, that his life was one of consistency, that he loved the Lord, and that he loved his family, and dear Lord, we know that he loved his church family. Dear Lord, we know that our, our brother Chuck fought the good fight. Dear Lord, we know he, he like I said, was a, was a minister 24 hours a day. If he was on the golf course or the baseball field or whatever, dear Lord, he was the same. He was a Christian first. Dear Lord, we know that he fought the good fight, that he knocked doors continually. He was continually going up and down his neighborhood and everybody in this Cold Spring area, that he has touched their lives. And dear Lord, we know that he ran the race and he knew, many times would tell us this is not a 100-yard dash, but it's a marathon. And dear Lord, we know he did that and he ran it well. As he always talked about being better and he always talked about the Beatitudes. Dear Lord, we know he kept the faith as he always studied from your word. And dear Lord, we know now that he has received the crown of righteousness uh, that we all strive for. And dear Lord, we pray that as we hear from the many men here, that our service here, with us knowing Chuck, that we will all strive to be better people, that we all want to see our brother once again. And we know that he uh, lived the life of a servant, and he had a humble heart, and he had a love for you, dear Lord. And as we all strive to get... Uh, that reward, and as we all strive to hear those words that are, we know that our brother Chuck heard, and he says, well done, that good and faithful servant. And dear Lord, we thank thee for your son who came upon this earth, who set an example for our lives, and gave his life as a ransom for our sins, and we all have the opportunity now to go to heaven and have our sins forgiven. And dear Lord, we thank you for that, and we love you, and we ask you to continue to bless us through this service today. And as we look forward to worshiping with the saints in the morning, in Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen. <clears throat>
But uh, tenacious was Charles. I mean, that's the way he was. For me to live is Christ and to die. It's gay. It's gay. It's gay. Uh, Charles had wisdom, a lot of it. He shared it. Uh, Chris Gowen was, was telling me, he said, working with people is messy business <laughs> is something that he said. And he had these kinds of ways of summing concisely up uh, things about life and Christianity. He was wonderful as a mentor. Uh, he was one who would say to family, say to Diana, say to Steve, say to Betty, don't worry. Don't worry. There's no need to worry. Now, he's concerned about things, getting things done, but worrying was something you weren't supposed to do. You just don't worry. He was uh, perhaps the best father-in-law a missionary could have. And just Wednesday, we completed 20 years in mission work. And... Uh, so much of that is the way he raised a wonderful daughter, my wife. And um, the things he instilled in her because God had taken him to Japan. And, and there in Japan, he saw the world. And he saw that the world was vast. And there were so many people that needed Jesus. And so they would always eat out in restaurants. They served different kinds of foods. And foreign restaurants so that his son and his daughter could have ex that experience of a little taste of somewhere else in the world. Well, that certainly um, influenced uh, Diana and, and uh, certainly was a blessing, has been a blessing for me, uh, going to the mission field sight and scene to Argentina and, and all that we experienced there and, and now in our 60s in Honduras. He inspired us with his actions. He encouraged us when it had been really easy to give up because this kind of thing is tough. He only advised us when we asked for advice and wisdom. What a wonderful father-in-law to me and for what we were about and have been about. But not just to me, to so many of you. He, were the, he was that and so much more. You notice in the video presentation his baptismal certificate. Um, and in Latin American style, we would have a sermon inviting everyone to respond to the gospel because... If you've not responded to the gospel, now's the time to do that. I, I think he had a little bit of Latin in him because Charles would not want anyone leaving today who had not obeyed their Lord and given their life over to him and were baptized into Jesus Christ. So we'll make, make that as an invitation today even. If there's someone that couldn't make Charles happier to know that someone on this day was baptized into Christ, because of the influence of his life and of Jesus Christ most of all. Evangelism, I, I've said it to my students and I've said it to other people. If he had a Bible study, it was just a matter of time. <laughs> if he could get that Bible study, it was just a matter of time before you're going to be baptized. He had such a thoroughness in his presentation of the gospel. And he loved you. You knew that he loved you so dearly. This was not fake. This was not for somebody else. This was because he genuinely loved you and he wanted you to know that Jesus loved you. So we sing today, Liberty, a song that, uh, that he wrote and uh, others have sung. Walt surely have sung. Uh, but uh, we'd like to sing that at this moment. Baptized in Jesus Christ, the one within each day. Baptized in Jesus 
From Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Eric is uh, one of his grandsons, and close out our service Today, another grandson, Jonathan, our son, will also lead a prayer. I'd like now to ask uh, Stephen and then later Phil Basket to come forward. To honor my dad, I want to very briefly share three brief lessons that I learned from him out of the many, many lessons that I could have chosen. And I'm an ex-preacher, so when I say briefly, I, I do mean briefly. Uh, you can count on it. But uh, one of the main things I learned from my dad, and one that he emphasized over and over again, was that hard work can help you overcome a lot of obstacles. Many years ago, one night we were going through some of the old books at the house, and we pulled out dad's old high school uh, yearbook. And there were a couple of statements in there in the section that they used to have in the yearbooks. I don't know if they do it anymore. But back in those older yearbooks, they had the sections where different students would share their memories of different people. And there were a couple of memories of my dad that really stood out and got, caught my attention. Memory number one is Charles Gamble likes Rosedale girls. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, and from hearing Dad tell all his war stories, he dated every one of them. But we all know who he ended up with, don't we? And he got the best one, didn't he? And so I, I, I like that quote, but another one that I really loved, Charles Gamble is a squirt. <laughs> and, uh, and you saw the picture up here a little bit earlier. 
And you know that dad was a late bloomer physically. He was about five foot two until he was a junior or senior in high school. And that provided him with a, a lot of disadvantages because he grew up in the state of Indiana. And back at that time, I think it was state law that you had to try out for the basketball team. <laughs> and so he not only tried out, but he made the team. But dad always would always talk about that. He'd say, Steve, you know, I, I was always smaller. And so the way that, that I made up for my size was I just had to out-hustle everybody. I had to work harder than everybody. And I would just pester those big guys, you know, all these David and Goliath type of stories. And he continued that theme on when he told me then, not only in high school did I have that difficulty where I had that, sort of that disadvantage I had to overcome, but even then when I went to college, that I started school early and I didn't have as good an education as a lot of the other kids did. And so I had to study harder. And it worked out pretty well for him, didn't it? So dad really valued hard work and taught me to do the same. A second lesson from dad I learned was that you need to be a mentor. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And dad believed that this type of mentoring started at home. And especially then he thought it was his obligation to teach me all those important lessons that men of his generation taught their sons. And so dad taught me how to throw a curveball. Dad taught me how to hit a curveball. Dad taught me how to skin a squirrel. Dad also taught me which mushrooms I could pick and eat and not die. <laughs> and those were all very important lessons that I learned from my dad. But of course, he taught me the most important lesson of all was to love God with all my heart and to love my neighbor as myself. So dad was a mentor to me, and I know he was to many of you as well. And finally, a very important lesson from my dad is that you need to immerse yourself in the word of God. You know, it might surprise you to, to, to hear that we weren't a family that was big on having family devotionals. But every day of my life that I can remember, I saw dad opening up the word of God. Oftentimes, I guess I would see him do it. He'd go to his bedroom and close the door into his office and study in there, but I knew that's what he was doing. And so dad taught all of us in the family that we needed to love God's word and to immerse ourselves in that word. And again, I know he taught many of you that very same thing. And so dad, dad was not a perfect man. I don't think mom will tell you any of his faults today, but in her more honest time, she might go ahead and share some of those faults with you. He had plenty of them. But he was a good man. He was a, man, a good man because of these things that we just talked about and many others as well. And that's why we're here to honor him today. I'm really pleased to uh, share a couple of things with you this morning, this evening, this afternoon. Um, Chuck and I met each other in 1974. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that uh, in a moment. But I was thinking how much he loved the Bible, how much he loved the scriptures. And so I, I chose three that I think would be very meaningful to share with you. This is out of Psalms. I don't know what made me think I wouldn't need my glasses. Okay, here we go. Uh, Psalms 119, beginning of verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. He loved the word of God. And uh, I'll mention a little bit more about that in a moment. And then another one, which I think uh, really just says something about 
uh, Chuck, is the, um, again from Psalms, where it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So it's just a great, great thought to remember here as we remember and celebrate his death. And then the other one, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And as far as I uh, knew, Chuck uh, greeted every day with that kind of an attitude and tried to live life that way. So I'd like to tell you now how our lives uh, came together and what a profound uh, influence he had. And really, my purpose in this is to uh, show him honor, to be sure, but he, uh, he would very, very much want you to be encouraged to be as evangelistic as you can be. And maybe from this story, maybe you'll be encouraged to be even more outspoken about the gospel of Christ. So in 1974, I was uh, 27 years old, uh, had two children, and was uh, agnostic, had no idea if there was a God, if there was, how many there might be. I had just uh, become a little bit defeated about, about the whole subject, thinking there very well may be, but I don't think anybody really knows very much about it. So at that point in time, I was working at the same company as Chuck, Delco Electronics, and uh, I had an assignment to work with Chuck. So I went over to meet Chuck. And uh, I remember very well uh, uh, where he sat, and uh, there he was behind his desk, a sport coat about like this one, dark sport coat, had a, had a big black Bible up there on his desk like that. And uh, he's, I have to calculate how much older, be about 15, 16, 17 years older than me. And so my first impression, being agnostic and thinking, you know, not too highly of uh, religious people, maybe in general, I, my first thought was, oh boy, <laughs> what, what, how is this going to work? And then one of our first assignments was that we needed to make a trip to Detroit together. And that was about a four or five hour trip by car. So I thought, what in the world are we going to talk about? So I thought, well, I know, because I, I had, in spite of the agnosticism, I, I had interest. You know, I had read a number of books. I, it wasn't that I wasn't interested. So I thought, I'll ask him, Chuck, why are you so religious? And I didn't uh, have any better way of expressing the thought or the question, so that's what I said. Only several years later did I find out that he thought, at that moment in time, he thought, he's going to give me a hard time. He's just, <laughs> he's just starting to give me a hard time. Not that he cared. I mean, he, was, he greeted the question as an opening of the door to, to express his faith. So, so we talked, uh, as best I can remember, nonstop, four or five hours uh, on that subject. And then on the way home, four or five hours on that subject. And he had a lot to say. I had a lot of questions. And it was, it was just great. I don't doubt for a moment that the Lord had managed this. Because uh, sharing the same engineering outlook, uh, way of uh, dissecting, way of analyzing everything in life, I guess, uh, we shared that common uh, uh, background, and so he was very, very well prepared to talk to me about why uh, the Bible is the Word of God, and uh, why God is there, who he is, what he thinks of us, how he relates to us. So as we uh, approached Kokomo, Indiana, on the way back, he proposed that he and Betty come over and uh, he had some film strips that uh, he wanted to show us, that my wife and I he wanted to show us. And um, he also proposed that uh, he share uh, some uh, tapes, some cassette tapes, remember those? Cassette tapes uh, of John Clayton. John Clayton still uh, does a wonderful work out of South Bend, Indiana. And now it's no longer cassette tapes, but it's you know the, all the digital 
um, ways of doing it. But so he, he gave me those tapes, and I started to listen to those tapes immediately. And I started to read, um, I, as best I remember, I started just reading the New Testament, not having the patience to start at the very beginning. Just started reading through the New, uh, New Testament. Chuck and Betty started coming over, and, um, and in a matter of, oh, I, I would guess a couple of months, uh, was ready to obey the gospel, and we did. And since that time, then, we've uh, maintained that close relationship through the years. Uh, Chuck uh, shared it in an oh-by-the-way type of a way, I think, one day that he had thought at different times about uh, going down to the uh, Sunset School of Preaching, quitting his work at Delco and, and doing that. And that planted that seed of thought. I don't think he was probably doing it on purpose, but he, that planted that seed of thought in my mind. And so uh, uh, over a period of months, maybe even more than a year, I decided that's what I wanted to do. So, uh, so when I told Chuck about it, I think that was uh, all he needed to uh, go ahead and, and make that decision himself. So in August 1976, both of us went down and, and spent two years together uh, in the Sunset School of Preaching, studying Bible. I not only got a full dose of it from the teachers there, but Chuck and I <laughs> would just uh, continue the conversation between classes, and so it was, it was really uh, nonstop. And just a great uh, education from those teachers and from Chuck during that time, too. So uh, it's just a, a great um, encouragement. Remember, he thought, what am I going to do with this guy? What am I going to say to this agnostic who's, who's ready to give me a hard time, I think is what he was thinking. Well, he, he just presented the truth as best he could which was quite good, and it's uh, made a profound difference in my life and my family's life and several people around me. And just, uh, it really, um, I hope it will really encourage all of us today. I know that uh, Chuck would be very, very pleased if we left here today just a little bit more determined just a little bit more anxious to share the gospel.
do, who's a dear friend from Kokomo, fellow elder with uh, Chuck there in, in Kokomo to come forward and share. Um, and I saw also Randy Plogger, who is, uh, many of you know, was here, and then in uh, Wapakoneta and helped in the staff of that congregation, and Tom Painter, an elder, and uh, someone very dear to the family, as, as all of the Painter family uh, was to the, to the Gamble family. Brother Walt, let me ask that also if there are those who would like to share after uh, Tom Painter has uh, shared a few words, we would also like to encourage you to come forward and to share from the pulpit as well. Well, first of all, I want to thank the Gamble family for inviting me to speak on this occasion. I consider it an honor and a privilege. Although Chuck and I graduated from the same engineering school, Rosa Polytechnic Institute, gradu Chuck graduated two and a half years before I even started going to engineering school. It wasn't until 1966 that Chuck Betty, Diana, and Steve moved from Dayton, Ohio to Kokomo, where he began to work for Delco Electronics GM. The Gambles worshiped with us at Alto Road of Christ and served as an elder, the same time that I was also serving as an elder for the church. Chuck was a great student of the Bible. And very early in our relationship in the kingdom, we began to sharpen swords, steel against steel. Chuck helped the church to become more focused on souls and started a class on taking the gospel to the young church in the community. When Diana started her studies at Fried Hardeman Christian College, Henderson, Tennessee, Chuck and I took her and other youth from Alto Road to become acquainted with the school. Chuck and I would return to the school every year in February for the Bible lectureships. This became a tradition for the two of us. And as soon as our children were out of the nest, our wives joined us. We would take van loads of the saints from Alto Road every year. After Chuck and Betty left Delco and Kokomo for Sunset School of Preaching, and after Chuck graduated from Sunset, we continued to go to Fried Hardeman lectureships. We would spend hours studying at the lectureships and then study late into the night, evening, the things that we'd study during the day. And by the way, we sat on hard bleachers they were hard, weren't they, Betty? <laughs> and I didn't have very much to sit on, so they were really hard. Chuck and Betty and Shirley and I sang together for all kinds of occasions. Chuck, of course, sang the tenor, Betty sang alto, Shirley soprano, and I sang the bass. Shirley and I would come and visit them while they were serving the Lord here. And we would uh, record, we recorded several hymns. And we even rented a facility here 
Cold Spring, and had a professional technician help us record some of these songs. And from what I've heard, the family still has those recordings, and I've heard us sing them over and over. Chuck actually wrote some of the songs that we recorded. Now, I could talk all afternoon about our experiences with Chuck and Betty. But the message I want to leave with you is I want to testify of the love and the service of Chuck and Betty's service to their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We owe so much to this loving couple in regard to our own growth in the kingdom. When I think of Chuck Gamble, I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul to Titus. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. It was okay to disagree with Chuck. He invited disagreement. But I want to tell you something. When you disagreed, you better be ready. Because it's going to be a long and rigorous night. And Phil already told you about his drives to Detroit and back. Well, Betty and I and Shirley would drive from Kokomo to Fried Hardeman every year. And all the way there and all the way back, Chuck and I were into the word. And sometimes, because I'm just an honorary guy, I would disagree on purpose. I really agreed with it. But I would disagree. <laughs> and oh my goodness. It really got intent <laughs> as we go through the scriptures over and over and over. We both were students of Revelation. And he wrote his commentary and I wrote mine. And we compare notes. And we didn't agree on all things. And that was okay. But Chuck told me one time, he says, Walt, have you really delved into the book of Zechariah? And I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, you need to. And then every year he said, have you, have you studied the book of Zechariah yet? And I said, no. Well, when are you going to do it? Well, Chuck, I did it. I taught the book this last year and wrote my own commentary. And I have to agree with you, Chuck. Wow. If you think Revelation is a tough book, <laughs> get your hands around Zechariah and wrap your brain around Zechariah. It's a fantastic study. Chuck and I would go to Fried Hardeman and we'd normally wear sport coats and trousers or suit. And the girls always tried to be sure Chuck and I were presentable. And they sometimes had different ideas of what was presentable and he and I did. And so we decided one day we're going to change coats. And so, you know, my size and you know Chuck's size. And we both had these wine colored sport coats. So I put on Chuck's. His sleeves up to here, you know. He's got mine on. His sleeves are down here, I guess, you know. And, and we act like we don't know what's going on. We're walking ahead of the girls. And pretty soon, Betty and Shirley sure saying, What are you guys doing? It took them probably 20 minutes before they realized that we had changed those coats. <laughs> and we didn't think we were going to get anything out of that, but we got quite a bit out of it before it was over with. There are so many stories. One, one time, Chuck and I, as elders at Alto Road, Kokomo, went to Saskatchewan, Canada, because we had a missionary up there, Charles McKnight. It took us all day to get there. I mean, we left early in the morning, and it's late at night that we're getting in a car to make the last journey into Saskatchewan. And we get there, and here's Charles and his wife, and they're so excited that we come. And Chuck and I are about ready to fall asleep on our feet. And they said, let's sing. <laughs> Chuck and I looked at her and said, let's do what? <laughs> let's sing. So... We get out the hymn books and we're singing. And 
<laughs> Finally, they realized that these guys are going to sleep in the middle of the songs so if we don't stop. So they take us to our bed. Now, get a picture of this. It's a three-quarter size bed. And Chuck and I go back to the room and we, we start to get in that bed and we start laughing. I think we're ever going to stop laughing. And I take my pillow and I put it down where my knees will be because I've got back trouble and I have to sleep with my knees propped up or it puts too much strain on my back. Chuck looks over and he says, Walt, where are you going to put your head? <laughs> uh, we, we like to never got settled down that night. And here we are in this bed. We can't move. And it's like this, you know. And we woke up the next morning and we both were just like this. <laughs> we, we hadn't moved. We were frozen in that position. We were so tired when we ever got there. In singing for funerals, we had one experience I want to share with you now, then I'll be quiet and I'll quit. But Chuck and Betty and Shirley and I were singing for one of the Watkins family's funeral. And we'd practice songs and we knew our songs well and we'd sung them so many times. And, but this particular day, we started out Shirley and Betty on one song and Chuck and I on another one. We'd never done anything like that before. We stopped and then we started. And fortunately, the girls submitted to their leadership and started on the same song that Chuck and I were on. We loved Chuck and Betty beyond description. You know why? They first loved us. And uh, someday soon, Chuck, Betty Shirley and I are going to be with you. I'll bring the pitch pipe. You write the songs. I first met Chuck back in the summer of 1986 up in Walpawkinet, Ohio. There were several of us that were worshiping with the Lima congregation, but there was always a great desire to start a congregation down in Walpawkinet. So one of the brethren had heard about a preacher down in Texas that was looking for a congregation to start in northern uh, Ohio, up north of Dayton. And he made contact with the Walnut Congregation and they found out about Chuck Gamble. And so Chuck and Betty reached out to us and there was a small group of about 30 who lived in Walpawkinetta that wanted to start worshiping there. So we met with Chuck and Betty in the early uh, fall of 1986. And uh, we expressed our interest into starting the congregation to the congregation in Lima, and they gave us our blessing. So then we started making plans. So one Sunday evening, we had wanted to meet with the Walden Hill elders, along with Chuck and Betty. So the elders flew up from Texas and they came to church with us Sunday morning at the Lima congregation and then they worshiped with the Sunday night planning to meet down in Walpawkinetta on Sunday evening after services. And uh, so after Sunday evening services there were about 20 of us that had to get into our cars and drive down to Walpawkinetta 15 miles away and they came to my wife and my uh, rented house at the time and we set up the chairs in the living room and we uh, was meeting everybody. And of course, you understand that we all drove from Lima in different cars. And also, you also understand that not many of us knew much about Chuck and Betty at that time. Well, we were all getting together and we're, the meeting was just about ready to start. 
and that we are all sitting in a circle, then one couple came late. And they walked to the door and knocked on the door, and we opened the door, and they walked in. And Chuck said, Brother Tanner, would you lead us in closing prayer? <laughs> that was the first indication of who we were getting into with our preacher. And, of course, Chuck was such a, uh, an ornery, ornery person. Uh, I, I can't think of a better word to describe who he is. I'm going to turn this down. Uh, when we met, he just fell in love with the congregation. The congregation fell in love with him. His ministry was not that of one of just preaching. His ministry was one of loving souls. And that's my experience with him, is he loved souls. He loved to laugh, too. Don't get me wrong. His smile will be ingrained in my brain for the rest of my life. Uh, and that's who he was. Uh, the kids, we were a young congregation. About 50% were young children under the age of sixth grade. And he was just as ornery with those kids as possible. And it was important for my family at that time because we had a personal tragedy in our family where we lost my wife's father. So my two children lost, lost a grandpa. Chuck and Betty became their grandparents. And that meant a whole lot to us. Now, Chuck was voracious in teasing my kids. Uh, he would tell my teenage daughter, he said, do you know the secret of catching a guy? He said, you, ch uh, you let him chase you, and you let him chase you, and you let him chase you until he catches you. Oh, no, I'm sorry until you catch him. I, <laughs> I messed it up. I messed it up. But uh, that's the way Chuck was, just voracious teaser. But just because he loved to laugh and because he loved to tease, when it came to worshiping his God, when it came to loving God, he did it in such a loving fashion. Uh, I appreciate Steve's description of him when he said he was very tenacious. And I'll go one step further. He was very tenacious on saving souls. And th that is not a trite sentiment that we give often to preachers. That was a reality. He was tenacious on saving souls. So that meant when he looked at me, when he looked at our family, when he looked at our con congregation, he didn't see people to love, which we, we, he did. He loved us. But he looked at us as souls. What's best for us to have a loving relationship with our Father in Heaven? He taught us how to love. And I'll tell you, in many, many ways, he taught us several lessons on how to love one another. First of all, he taught us that confronting people was a loving thing to do. It was his practice to go out and, and meet people and set up Bible studies. Anybody here, does anybody here know of a time when Chuck was not involved in a personal Bible lesson with some folks? Every time I was speaking with him, he had two or three Bible lessons, Bible studies going on. When we were at Walpaw Canetta, we started out with 30 folks and we grew to 40 folks and 50 folks and 60 folks. And in six years, we grew to 100, over 100. Now, yes, we had our neighborhood Bible schools where we would invite all the kids in the neighborhood, the flower streets of Walpaw Canetta, to come down to Chuck and Betty's house where we'd have, we'd have VBS. We didn't have a building at the time. Yes, we would go door knocking in Walpaw Canetta, invite folks out. But Chuck would be the first one to deny that our growth was because of his efforts. But I'll guarantee you that's why we grew as fast as we did. It's because of his personal Bible studies. We'd be worshiping, and some new folks would come in to the worship. Of course, my wife and I were busy in Bible school, 
And we'd later find out that, well, Chuck was Bible studying with these folks and he, they're going to be baptized this Sunday. We didn't know that, but he was like that. Years later, after he came back down here to Cold Springs to worship, our family would come down every one or two years to visit with him. And one year, we took our 13-year-old niece with us to come visit. Chuck and Betty didn't know her, but it was our niece. And uh, we spent the weekend here, and we spent time with her. And we were visiting with Betty, and, and Chuck asked Lindsay, my niece, to come and talk. And they went back into his office and talked. And about an hour later, my niece comes out and had some tears in her eyes. She didn't tell us what they were talking about. Chuck didn't tell us what they were talking about. We traveled home. Uh, my niece went on and uh, back to her home and we did what we do. Two months later, I got a phone call from my niece, Lindsay. She said, I want to be baptized, and I want Chuck to baptize me. I said, Lindsay, I'll get on the phone and call Chuck and Betty. That night at 8 o'clock at night, we called Chuck and Betty. Chuck says, I'll be up there tonight. Can't she be there tonight? I called back to Lindsay. Lindsay says, no, I can't. How about tomorrow night? I called back to Chuck and says, we'll be there tomorrow night. And the next night, Betty and Chuck traveled up 120 miles, 130 miles, to baptize my niece. I'm indebted to the Gamble family. That is their practice. That's Chuck's practice, to use every opportunity that he can because he sees people as souls. Another lesson that he taught us at Walpaw-Canetta, and I'm convinced that he taught it down here, was to be kind to one another. And when you be kind to one, or one another, you do not say mean things to each other. In fact, as we would have baptisms up in Walpaw-Canetta, and we had quite a few every year, then the following Sunday, Chuck would get up in the pulpit, and he would invariably mention just a couple, mi a couple minutes of how we believe it is a, it is a sin to say bad things to one another. And we learned that lesson after every baptism or after every, uh, every uh, membership, place membership, because he said it often. And I don't mean to say, he, he truly was kind in how he approached and confronted others. About eight years ago, we were down here visiting with him, and he, he called me back into his office, and he said, Randy, would you read this over for me? And I said, well, what is it? And he said, well, uh, last month I was reading a, a, a lesson from a, a publication, a Christian publication, and uh, I, the, he disagreed with the author. So what he did was, for the last month, he studied the subject which is what Chuck does. And, he after, and then after that, he spent two weeks writing this letter. And then he asked me to read this letter. Now, let me explain. He didn't ask me to read the letter to, to critique the doctrinal issues or the theology of his argument. He asked me to read this letter to see if it was kind enough. And it started out... Dear Brother So-and-So, I read your publication, and I thought it was very good. I really enjoyed it. There were a lot of points that he brought up. And he says, I want to address something that you may have not have thought about. Chuck went overboard to be kind. And that's the way his life was. His was not a ministry of just preaching. His was a ministry of loving. He often pre preached about Matthew chapter 18. When you have something wrong against another, you go to them first public, privately. 
and try to address with, with them privately before you bring it into a public manner. And um, I cannot tell you how many <coughs> confrontations he has been in over the last 30 years. The reason why I can't tell you is he won't tell me. He never told me. But every once in a while, uh, he would give me a phone call. I remember about eight years ago, I was out working at my mother-in-law's backyard. I got a phone call on my cell phone. He said, Randy, I wanted to talk to you about this scripture. I thought, oh my, he's struggling with somebody uh, in the brotherhood, a congregation or, or something. I, 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 after the 45 minutes of talking, I'd sit back there and think, what was that about? Uh, he wouldn't tell me, but I know that he had been invited to congregations to help resolve a solution, or that he's talked with other folks to be a part of a, a mending effect. He truly loved to be in God's kingdom but he wanted to be like his loving savior. And this is how he saw Jesus as the loving shepherd. And then he taught me a very valuable lesson and I wanna share this personally. He taught me how to forgive. Years ago, I had done something publicly in the congregation foolishly. It wasn't wrong. But I had done something that people perceived of as wrong, and it caused a ruckus. I did it innocently. I didn't know about it until a brother that Sunday night handed me a three by five card and asked me to read these scriptures. I said, okay. So I stuck it in my pocket, went home. When I got home, I got them out, looked them up. My brother perceived me as doing this. And I felt bad. I felt so bad that when I went to work the next day, I brewed about it all day long until finally after work, I drove over to Chuck's house. His house was only three blocks away from my house. Knocked on his door, he answered, said, Chuck, can we talk? He brought me in, we sit down. I laid out my heart in tears and I said, I hurt folks. And he listened and he listened and that the more he listened, the more he hurt for me. And finally I said, what do I do, Chuck? He says, I can't tell you that. But I'll say, asking for forgiveness is easy. And this is the lesson I wanna share with you today. Asking forgiveness is easy. He says, all you do is go to the brother who you offended and ask for his forgiveness and mean it. And it's all done. The world doesn't see forgiveness this way, but in the Lord's church, this is the way our Lord and Savior tells it to be. Over the years, I've asked forgiveness several <coughs> times and it is easy. It's easy when you love more than your own pride. Asking forgiveness is easy, and Chuck was that type of a person. I, his life is an indelible lesson for my family. My family owes him a great debt of appreciation. Betty was an amazing woman that had an amazing relationship and amazing life. And we, we love them dearly. Thank you. You know, it's, uh, it's probably trite at funerals to use superlatives. He was the best. He was the greatest. And all those things can aptly be applied to Chuck. But I want to point out something just a little different about Chuck. He was incredibly average, 
maybe not in his height, but he often told us, those who, uh, who were in classes with him, how average his intellect was, how hard he had to work, as, as Steve talked about, to keep up with the smarter people, the older people, et cetera. I think Chuck was pretty smart. He was just being, uh, being humble. But there was nothing about Chuck that said, this guy's a superstar. But yet you've heard people come one after another, and if we were to spend all afternoon here, you could hear it from pretty much everyone here. Chuck had impact. Chuck and Betty had impact. Because Chuck was a, he was a team player. I got to play basketball with Chuck. I was, I was actually smaller than Chuck at the time. Uh, he, he, could, uh, he could definitely shoot over top of me. He was a team player. He never kept the ball, even to a little squirt like me that had no idea what to do with the ball. He was part of it. He was a team player. He started with, with Betty. That was, that was his team and his kids, the church that he was working with, the brotherhood across the, across the world. That was Chuck's team, and he made everybody better. Most of the folks who have, who have talked met Chuck later in life, either in college or high school, college, or in the work world. I had the distinct privilege of meeting Chuck when I was seven years old, I think. I was here that uh, April 15th, I wanted to do the math. I'd get one of the engineers to come up and do the math for me. But April 15th, 1979, I was here. I met Chuck for the first time, and he had an impact on me. A few years later, he, he became my father in the faith one Wednesday night right here in the, the cold water. Uh, the building was uh, not even commissioned for use yet, but we, uh, we snuck in against the uh, fire code. Uh, is Adam here? I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, we, we snuck in here before we had occupancy, and we used the baptistry, and he, and he baptized me. So he's, he's been my father in the faith, and I could tell you story after story, but I won't. I'll skip to the last point where Chuck and I had a lot of interaction. That was when he was back here at Summit working in, as personal work. And he decided around 2001, it's actually Hall whatever the Wednesday night closest to Halloween was, that he was going to begin a class targeted toward young men in the congregation that needed to be firmed up in the scriptures. And it was going to be like a three to six month class. Donna smiling. It turned into a five year class every Wednesday night. We weren't even allowed to come in for the devotional before class. We had to report immediately at seven o'clock to the kitchen and we would not get out until 805, 810, something like that. And he taught us and he taught us. And yes, I know Revelation inside and out because he taught us. And I can tell you, Revelation was written after AD 70. Some of, yeah, some of you will get that. So Chuck was faithful. Chuck was a team player. Chuck made everyone better. He made everyone want to go out and be like Chuck. So he didn't have to be great in and of himself. He made all of us great around him. So as I wrote in a bulletin article that is, um, will be published tomorrow, it's been out on the web, the, the harvest that Chuck is responsible for can't possibly be counted today. It's still going. The people that Chuck directly impacted are still out there teaching souls. So the, the numbers continue to pile up. And it's already been shared, so I won't go and read it. But 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 said, Entrust to others, to reliable men, what you've been taught, who can share with others. And that's Chuck's legacy. Everywhere he went, he entrusted the word. Not his opinions, not his, his, um, his bully pulpit. He entrusted the word to those who would teach others. And I pray that we'll all continue to do that faithfully and carry on Chuck's legacy because it's formidable. It's important. It matters. God bless this family. Someone else would like to come for the next five minutes or so. And Bruce is coming. Anybody from Indiana? Well, Bruce and Dean, and then we'll have our songs, okay? Walter, something that you said that uh, struck a chord with me about discussing scripture with Chuck and occasionally disagreeing with him because invariably a week later he would bring a full report, 10 pages, discussing the scriptures that you 
talked about. Tom mentioned the five-year class that we had. That is one of the most precious memories I have of Chuck. Five years of studying the entire Bible, and it was in-depth, and the all of the documents that he shared with us, all of the writings, and he would underline and bold certain passages that would stand out. And I have all those on a large shelf. It is an amazing resource that I use in teaching classes now. But that five-year period where he was so intense on sharing his knowledge, knowing what was coming for him, uh, and Tom and Chris and I, those uh, were just precious times together. I remember the, um, the restoration trip that we all took. And Chuck, uh, he had a microphone. We were all in a van. And from place to place, as we would stop at different restoration uh, points, he was like a tour guide sharing with us all the information he had on it. Uh, just just precious memory because it he always pointed us to Jesus he he never wanted the emphasis to be on him however with Chuck and Betty one of the things that always struck me about them is that it reminded me of the story in Joshua 4 where the children of Israel crossed over and they were instructed to carry memorial stones In my life, Chuck and Betty have always been one of my memorial stones because in looking at their lives, they remind me of what the Lord has done for me. And now, I think of, when I think of Chuck, I think of the story with Abraham when the Lord had promised him that he would bless every generation and that uh, his offspring would be more than he could count in the sky. So now when I look up at stars, Chuck is one of those millions of stars that I can't possibly count. The love that Betty has for him, the example that, that she gave to my children. My children, when they think of godly women in the church, they instantly think of Betty, of the most humble, most loving, most serving. So Betty, I love you. And I'm so thankful for your life and Chuck's life and what it has done for me. Dean, you're not allowed to say any uh, of those stories your dad had on your, your uncle. <laughs> uh, you can't do that. Uh, c coming from Indiana is uh, a nephew, uh, Dean Gamble. I'm the uh, the next to the youngest and uh, also a former minister. Uh, so, Steve, you've set the example of being brief. I met Uncle Charles. It's not Chuck to, to any of us. It's Uncle Charles. Um, you know, before just about any of you. But it really has been, it was really in the last 19 years and actually the couple of years even before that, that uh, spent a whole lot of time other than Christmas and, and things. Um, Uncle Charles um, was competitive. <laughs> My wife's first uh, opportunity to see that was playing a board game one night. She didn't like the fact that Uncle Charles was playing according to different rules. <laughs> My dad was Don, um, the, uh, the youngest of the boys. There's two years difference between them. Um, my younger brother is a year and a half younger than I am. So I understand younger brothers and how they can irritate. But what I loved over the course of the last few years before, before his memory started failing him were the stories of, 
of growing up. The stories of, of, especially with my dad, stories that I had heard bits and pieces of that because of that engineer mindset was able to give me details of what happened. I've grown up on the Rosedale Road next to Miss Klein and when I was a kid, every Christmas we'd go by Miss Klein's house and it was a little farmhouse. She raised chickens and the house stunk. And I remember as a little kid and every year she would give my dad a one pound box of raisins. Which is an odd Christmas gift. Well, Uncle Charles told me the reason why. When my dad was little, he'd go over and ask for raisins. And Grandma got on him and he would and said, you can't go over there and ask for raisins. So he would go next door and said, Mom says I can't ask for raisins today. <laughs> or the time that Grandpa built the house on the Rosedale Road, they bought two coal mine shanties and took them down and moved the lumber out and straightened every nail by hand and grandpa came home one day and there were a lot of nails in the saw horses my dad had done it uncle charles told him not to and i think was there to say no don did it and luckily for, for my dad, Grandma was there to, uh, to take care of him. But on the opportunities since I was, became an adult to stop by and see Aunt Betty and Uncle Charles, there was always a meal, always some kind of pie. The last time was strawberry rhubarb, I remember that. And would tell stories, he'd get out the briefcase and show me things that he had worked on whether it was the first pacemakers or things with GM um, but as Kathy would say he was a gamble male and it doesn't fall far from the tree um, he'll be missed you know, it's been 19 years since my dad died. My youngest told me, Dad, don't cry. That's okay. She's seen me cry in the pulpit before. But the legacy that he's left, hearing the stories, um, Phil, I'd heard that story before. <laughs> Didn't know who it was, but I'd heard it. The legacy that, that he left, the legacy that my grandparents left with, with him and my uncles that filtered down to all of us. And uh, those are the memories that you, that you take with. And those are the things that make me who I am because of the extended family that loved us even though they irritated us sometimes. But they loved us and they loved the Lord. So, love you, Aunt Betty.
down by the lamb, oh yes. Well, the beast of the wild shall be led by little child, and I'll be changed, changed from this creature that I am. We'd like to close with a hymn, and we'd like to invite the congregation joined here together to join with us in it. If you'd like to pick up a hymn book and join with us, number 778, number 778. Then I'm going to ask Brother Teal to dismiss us in prayer. 778. If you're able to and care to, would you stand with me?
child's point of view, a memory of his. It was night before my graduation from high school, and I asked Grandpa, trying to be smart and wise, I said, what words of wisdom would you give me? Thinking that I would somehow unlock some magical key into what would be adulthood. And he said, read the book of Job. <laughs> and I asked him, I think again, maybe two or three more times, so what specifically, like, just read it once? He said, read the book of Job. Every year, read the book of Job. And I wanted just to read one little verse, and then I will close this in prayer. Because I could almost see um, Grandpa Gamble say this. Job 42, it's the very end, and it's when Job replies to the Lord. And I believe I could see him say these very words himself. To the Lord. I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, Who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. And I think that would describe his tenacity for trying to know God. Too wonderful for him to know. Verse 4, you said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. And I believe he could say these last words currently right now. Verse 5, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. God, as we uh, come before you together as family, as family of faith, a family of blood, a family that has been connected by stories, by experiences, by interactions, by meals that have been shared. We're thankful for a man who finally has gotten to know you. We thank you for his um, desire in, in, in striving to know you, God, that has challenged us to know you more. It has always brought us back to what matters, and that is you. And God, we are thankful um, that he gets to celebrate with you. As uh, my son prayed the other night, uh, that he's having fun with you in heaven, God. Thank you for a life well lived. Thank you for a life that we've been able to enjoy and remember. From the stories of him being a squirt to him, always working hard to loving family, to loving uh, this church, to loving others, God. Thank you for his life. And God, uh, thank you for the encouragement that it is to have known him and how he's encouraged us to know you better and to love you more, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a, a comment here. Uh, we will uh, ask that the Gamble family uh, go to the foyer, and they will receive you as we uh, uh, depart today. Thank you for the comments that were shared, and may God be glorified in all of it. Gambles, would you? Oh, uh, there's, there's my wonderful memory here. Uh, my wife... Uh, that uh, Chuck is going to be with us, with us here. His remains, his ashes will be uh, kept here at this congregation. We're not sure exactly where they will be deposited, but they will be deposited here uh, as, 
as he so loved you, so many of you, and he so loved the church. So those ashes will remain here. And we ask the family to uh, go to the foyer. Some of you have traveled long distances, and we are very thankful for your coming and uh, sacrificing to be with the family today. Uh, so many wonderful memories from the Gambles in Indiana. They really appreciate their coming a long distance to be here today as well. Thank you very much. May God bless.